really excited to to have uh, Deepo Adesini here with us. Um, first off, Deepo, how, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. No, no, it's good. It's good. Appreciate you. You know, definitely have been following your journey uh, for a little bit uh, there in Rwanda, and uh, really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule here to join us today. Um, just maybe in terms of intro, I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Imanzi Katari, and I'm the co-founder of Rwandapreneur. Uh, Rwandapreneur is a platform uh, to connect, amplify, and increase the global awareness of entrepreneurs that are committed um, to Rwanda's socioeconomic growth. And um, this is our Entrepreneur's Talk session. Um, so we've been doing a few of these uh, throughout the year. And um, really, we really want to create a platform, a space where we can connect with various entrepreneurs um, that are doing some great impactful work on the continent and also um, have linkages and are connecting also within Rwanda as well. Um, and so we're delighted to have uh, Deepo here today um, to talk a little bit about his journey. Um, he had a really incredible journey um, and I, I, I actually had a chance to, um, to, to attend one of his recent sessions where he was talking about um, you know, his, his entrepreneurial journey and his investment journey there in Rwanda. So he's based there in, uh, in the U.S. And so, but maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Deepo, maybe to introduce yourself, maybe a little bit uh, to your viewers here who uh, may not know a little bit about you. And then I could go into uh, a few questions to uh, kick things off. Okay. Um, yeah, once again, my name is Deepo Addison. I'm very humbled just to be on this platform. Anytime I get a chance to speak about entrepreneurship or what we do, um, it's an exciting moment for me, um, mainly because I know that uh, the information, you know, often leads to some type of inspirational transformation to people, right? And that's really what I'm about. So essentially, uh, Deepo Addison is based out of the United States, um, married with a, an amazing wife. I just celebrated my 10th year anniversary, um, December 10th. Uh, I, look, I look very young, but I have three kids, uh, eight, six, and three. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I've been an entrepreneur since my, my early teens. And I've just had that proclivity to, you know, stock things and just, you know, make money, right? Um, did that throughout my college days, high school days. Um, but now that I'm an adult, you know, we run multiple businesses here in the United States, businesses in Rwanda, businesses in Nigeria, um, well, if you can't tell by my name, I am a Nigerian, so I'm a Nigerian American per se. Uh, but once again, we, when I say we, my brother and I, we and my partners, we love Africa. Um, we're constantly, you know, going back and forth. Uh, my brother actually, after graduating from Penn State University here in the United States, uh, moved to Nigeria just to continue that entrepreneurial venture. Um, and then from there, we were able to kind of see, you know, the opportunities in Rwanda and, you know, years later, here we are just, you know, doing the little that we can to impact the, the nation. Great. Um, you know, it sounds like you definitely have a lot, a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts and just incredible you're able to do this with, you know, having a full plate on you in terms of your, your commitments and, uh, you know, three amazing kids as well there. So I know definitely, I can imagine that it's, it's not easy. Um, right. And so definitely, you know, give kudos to you and your wife and your family, you know, and, and, and really, you know, supporting you and the family like on this journey. Because, you know, one thing that I've, that I've learned, you know, through engaging with many entrepreneurs, obviously, is that, you know, recognizing like, what are the, what, what are the key priorities like in your life? And obviously, um, you know, we all have dreams and aspirations that we're chasing to, but, you know, it's important to stay humble and grounded. And, and obviously, you know, as, as, as Africans, obviously, you know, family means a big, uh, a big part of that. So definitely, definitely shout out to them. Um, yeah, so today's, today's chat, we're going to be um, diving deeper into um, Depot's journey uh, within entrepreneurship, specifically with a focus of um, his startup journey there in Rwanda. Um, so if you have any questions, Feel free to write any questions in the Q and A. Uh, if you have any comments, you could also put it into the chat as well. But um, definitely, if you have th this, will be the opportunity to ask Depot any questions you may have. Um, maybe just to give you a bit of perspective, Depot, maybe of some of the participants that are joining us here today, and so maybe across our network of entrepreneurs. So we're based here in Canada, but um, we have members and, and uh, network and stakeholders um, globally within the run in diaspora. So within Canada, US, Europe, Africa, um, and we've started 
you know, built up this platform over the last two years, I would say actually was born out of, you know, within COVID, but this is something that I've been very passionate for for the last few years and recognized uh -huh. in terms of really making a linkage and indeed, and obviously also growing up in a diaspora and also, you know, following a lot of, you know, the development and initiatives that are happening, you know, on the continent, and particularly in Rwanda. And so, you know, we're really making those strong connections and linkages. And so that's where this whole platform is based. So, um, you know, yeah, you know, we're, they're, there are folks here joining us from the diaspora, you know, friends of Africa and various different sort of backgrounds. Um, but maybe just getting right into it and, and you, uh, you kind of talked as to some, some couple of initiatives that you and your brother um, have started. Um, I'm wondering maybe if you could, you know, take it back and maybe start off with, you know, like how did you get involved, you know, within investing and doing business in Africa, right? And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, grew up, you know, as a Nigerian American there, you know, you know, what led you to really get, you know, invested in building businesses and what was, what was those early, what, what was the early, early journey like for you? Got you. So our journey started back in 2008 in Mount Z. We were, um, you know, I graduated from college in 2008. My brother also graduated in the same 2000, December, 2008. We're a year apart. I'm the oldest. And so we decided to take a journey to Nigeria, really just to start exploring opportunities. Um, then what happened was that we looked at the telecom sector. Uh, well, no, no, the electronic sector in Nigeria, uh, which was pretty booming at that time. So our first venture really as entrepreneurs on the continent of Africa was really selling electronics, mainly laptops. So we invested about $20,000, $30,000 is buying laptops because unlike today, it was not easily accessible back in 2009. Uh, we did that, took them home. Uh, we were able to sell some, and then we got our first bitter taste of what it means to do business in Africa. Uh, one of our uncles that we loved and trusted so much uh, came over to our hotel and um, you know saw the laptop stacked up and said, hey guys, I can help you sell these laptops. So needless to say, you know, we trusted him, took every single laptop box we had, and that was in 2009, when 2021, that was the last time we saw and heard from him, right? Um, so when you think about, you know, when you, when you hear people share their stories about bad experiences and doing business in Africa, we've had tons of that, but that did not derail us from continuing that journey. So we've had multiple setbacks. So we transitioned from electronics to, um, you know, to agriculture, right? So we tapped into the agriculture sector. We tapped into the food sector where we were able to start multiple restaurants in Nigeria. Um, also kind of did the agriculture thing on a big scale, um, you know, being able to create a platform for Africans in diaspora to invest in, you know, to kind of key into that. So um, that, that's, that was our journey, right? And then up until about three, four years ago, we started to look at other places in Africa that's conducive to do business. And that's how we kind of stumbled, <clears throat> that's how we kind of stumbled upon Rwanda. And I must say, it's probably one of the best decisions that we've made as far as where to do business in, in Africa. Okay, yeah, so, you know, definitely, you know, hearing a little bit about your background and, and obviously there was, there was that family peace connection, I guess, that brought you in there um, and then, you know, wanting to, wanting to contribute, which, which I think a lot of us, you know, had those, had those sentiments and obviously the first thing that we do, we reach out to family and friends say, hey, you know, what types of ventures can we explore, you know, how can we bring together our money and obviously we're, we're already sending money, you know, back home and, mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you know, looking at, you know, different ways how we could stretch those, 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 those opportunities. And I, sometimes I always think I'm like, man, like every year, like we send a lot of money back home. Oh, yeah. right? And obviously it's, it's, it, it's, it's needed. So obviously right. I'm not going to say that, but I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like how do we catalyze this into actually viable, you know, ventures, um, not just, you know, projects, sort of, right, you know, right. Right? but actually like viable ventures. And so I guess that's good to hear that, you know, you, I guess, you know, you had the first little um, experience and then obviously now trying to, to see, you know, what, what other opportunities are there. So I guess maybe, so you talked about um, getting into the marketplace of, of, of Rwanda, but, you know, I guess, you know, 
like what led you to to actually consider um, and launching a business? Because it's one thing, you know, to you know to to hear about the good opportunities or to follow from a distance, but you are the one that actually said, you know what, we're going to take this idea. We're actually going to follow through, which 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 is which is a big thing, right? Uh, definitely don't want to un underestimate that. So, what led you to actually consider investing um, and launching a business? Um, and then maybe explain a little bit about, you know, this business, uh, this bike share business that they started there. Okay. Yeah, I think that the journey for Rwanda started back in 2017 uh, when my brother and a few of our other partners took a trip to Nigeria, uh, not, not Nigeria, to Rwanda for just a different project per se, um, more of like a community service type of deal. And, you know, I will say, you know, um, Prior to my brother going to Rwanda a couple of years ago, and you got to think about it, right? You know, pretty much raised here in the United States, knew little about Rwanda. As a matter of fact, the only thing that I knew about Rwanda was based on a movie, Hotel Rwanda, right? You know, because that was what is at the fore that was at what was um, at my forefront a couple of years ago. So my perception about the country was completely different. Um, so I remember when my brother went to Rwanda and he said, look, man, we got to come here, right? Of course, I didn't know what he, you know, what he meant back then, but he emphasized as to why, number one, why not, Rwanda was probably the cleanest place in Africa, Kigali, right? The cleanest city in Africa. Uh, you know, things are very structured, unlike some of the other places that we've been to in Africa where, you know, it's really just, you got to have a tough skin. Um, so coming into that kind of helped us to understand that, well, they have the right infrastructure, right? That, you know, there's li really little to zero corruption, right? So when we think about doing business in Africa, these are some of the factors you got to put into place because, you know, we've done businesses, like I said, in Nigeria, and it's a different ballgame. So I remember him have, you know, having a conversation and he was like, look, you know, everybody in Rwanda walks or they are on motorcycles. Right. Some people ride bicycles and things like that. So why not introduce a, a, a type of you know, transportation means that allows, you know, an ordinary people, uh, ordinary people to be able to get around. So we kind of looked at what type of business model will work in Rwanda. Now, being from the United States, and I'm sure in Canada, you guys have some type of bike share, you know, business model you know, over there. So. We looked at that and kind of saw how that might fit into the market of Rwanda. Um, now, one thing you got to realize is that when we went into Rwanda, we didn't have any connections. We didn't know anybody, literally zero, right? So we really started from the ground up and, you know, doing market uh, research and development, understanding the market, the culture, you know. So we have two cultural backgrounds. We have the Nigerian culture background, and then we have the United States background. So coming into Rwanda, you know, the way things are done in Rwanda is completely different from what we experienced to, I mean, uh, uh, used to. So just to kind of cut the long story short, you know, we, you know, we were able to put together uh, a solid business plan at that time uh, based on the knowledge that we had to, you know, to start presenting to people in RADB and, um, you know, that was our, that was the beginning and we started to get positive feedback and from there we kind of saw you know what this might be a viable business model to fit this environment now when we first went in the first project we only had one project in mind which was gura gura right i'm not sure We got the same, you know, different articles and things like that um, online. But that was the first idea that we had. But because of, you know, this was something new in Rwanda, right? There were a lot of different um, hoops that we had to go through. There were, you know, regulations or policies that weren't in place to kind of fit that business model. So throughout that process, you know, you're talking about one, two, three years of waiting period. So we started to think about, what else can we do to still fit within the green transportation model, right? And I think, you know, for those of you who are, um, who are on here as entrepreneurs, you got to be able to think on your feet. You got to be able to think creatively when things aren't going the way that you plan. And during that waiting period is when we gave birth to all the other business models that we currently have now, which is pretty much, you know, doing, if not better than Gura, at least for now, 
um, you know, in Rwanda. So that's like a brief synopsis of how we got into the Rwanda market. Okay, okay. No, that, that's, it's, you know, sounds like it was, you know, a bit of a journey and, and obviously through the research and interesting thing that you said, like, obviously you, you came in, you know, not knowing the landscape, uh, had a very you know, limited knowledge, but you were, you were drawn, right? And it sounded, it sounds like it was like, like a natural, you know, sort of drawing in and or like a Absolutely. curiosity, um, you know, because that's, 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 that's always fascinating, right? Obviously, you know, when, when I'm talking with different folks, I'm going to, you know, one of the questions I'll ask them, okay, well, why did you enter that market, right? And some people say, well, hey, I, I heard they, they raised this amount of, you know, funding and this amount of unicorns and all these types of things, yeah. right? Like those high sort of, you know, uh, types of, um, you know, things that we, that we see on social media, right? So everyone kind of, you know, goes towards that. Um, but, you know, sounds like it was like, it was like a hustle for you, right? To, to oh, yeah. really start from the ground up and, you know, just seeing a little bit about, you know, the, the evolution of, of, of your the various different companies. So I guess maybe talking maybe a little about, about Guaride and um, I noticed recently that, you know, there's been some partnerships that you've, uh, I guess, had solidified like with the city, city of Kigali and, um, uh, in terms of you know providing the the infrastructure and the transportation yeah. and the grids and, and things like that and so you know maybe maybe we could talk a little bit about um your ride and i forgot to also mention to our participants if you have any questions again if you join us a little bit late feel free to to write your questions into the q a into the chat um you know this is your time right so definitely want to make this interactive so definitely if you have any questions um you know about Deepo's journey or any advice or anything like that then feel free but yeah Deepo, i'm wondering yeah maybe just you know explain to to people who are um you know obviously like we know about motels obviously any you know across you know any country there you know in africa everyone has motels but what you know why did you decide to invest in this electronic the green you know mobility and and maybe explain a little bit about that so I think when you think about green transportation as a whole, I mean, it's the future, right? I mean, being from the Western world, we already see it taking place. Unfortunately, Africa has been a dumping ground for a lot of used vehicles, um, causing a lot of, you know, pollution, emission, and all these other things that, you know, typically a, a typical uh, African wouldn't care about, right? So when you think about just kind of forward thinking, that was kind of what got us into that space. Now, one of the other things that really gave us the, the uh, um, the boldness to go into the space was that, you know, the government of Rwanda was already looking at, you know, transitioning into that e-mobility or green transportation. I think it was part of the vision 2020 that they have for the country, which happens to be something that we kind of took, you know, took and then ran with it. So obviously when you're doing business in a foreign country and you're doing something that the government is already interested in, it's an automatic attraction, right? So we didn't have any resistance as to what we were doing because that's what the government wanted to do. So that partnership was, you know, was easy. Um, I mean, I'm actually a lot surprised that. So when you talk about partnership, like even a president was involved, is involved in like the success of our project, right? I mean, and one of the reasons why we were able to push out, at least as soon as we did now, was because we were getting, you know, like, you know, calls from like the, you know, from the top, like, hey, now what's going on? When can you guys launch? Because it was a, it was a, it's a project that, number one, it's going to help the, you know, help the, the uh, Rwanda, but more importantly, it's a project that everybody wants to see su uh, successful. You know, when you talk about bike share, it's not something that, uh, most companies that operate bike share or try to operate bike share in Africa are mainly going in because they see it as a new market to expand or maybe, you know, raise money. So there's really no connection to it. We are Africans. You see what I'm saying? Yes, we might be, you know, African in, in, in Canada, in the United States. It doesn't matter. We're all Africans. So for us, It's more so about building the continent of Africa versus just making money. Because if it's just making money, we're making money in the United States. You guys are in Canada. I'm sure there's a lot of things you can do to make money as well. So, you know, having that mindset of actually developing a continent has led to attraction to doing things the right way. 
so that we can build the right structure and build the right partnership. So we have partnership with, you know, um, I mean, across all our projects, of course, with City of Kigali, with the government, with international organizations, um, you know, and we've just been growing from there. You know what I mean? Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Yeah. No, okay, no, that's that's great to hear. It's great to hear. Um, you know, like that you've been able to build up those strategic partnerships, and you know that that definitely helps. You know, along the way in terms of you know moving stuff, you know, moving forward. And obviously, I think even you know when it comes to business planning and, and, and when you're sort of you know getting into you know who are you know which is the right markets and obviously where you could align you know the vision of the company with let's say the vision of where the country is going and you know and obviously you know you started off with that you know vision 2020 that, that the country has Rwanda you know but now when I you know when I'm looking at it like they're 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 already making plans for 2050 right so very ambitious targets you know for 2050 they're you know 2030 it's just around the corner and obviously you know if, if we're looking at you know reducing greenhouse gases and embracing more green technology um so that's a big thing and so i've been definitely been seeing especially within the you know green run the space that that's you know an area that you know has been you know getting get, getting lots of traction um so i guess as your so how long has has the company been in operation there in in, in rwanda or on the continent so we we started we started in rwanda i think in 2017 right that's when we actually first you know went into the market um as far as like operation wise where people are able to use our product and i think it was maybe a couple of months ago right because you remember covid i mean our plan go back to last year you know planning to launch covid happened a lot of things got delayed you know with all of our projects really it's not us i mean of course globally but um but as far as like actually starting to operate we started out this year um which was i think back in either sep september thereabout right yeah mm -hmm. okay 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 and then so like i guess in terms of like the bike share so like you know even like i haven't <laughs> like i here in toronto like i see so many you know bike shares and and actually interesting enough i haven't actually tried an actual gotcha. you know renting out a bike and everything like that i'm like okay you know one day or i keep telling myself in summer like i'll, I'll go and, and test it out um but i guess so in the case of, of rondo you know you know being a very hilly country obviously called land of a thousand hills and obviously you know you know various different parts obviously in in, in moto accessibility is, is, is definitely pivotal so from a practicality standpoint you know, with, I guess, with, with the charging, like how is that, have you been able to build up the infrastructure with the charging or are you just starting off in just the city of Kigali with those charging spots and then wanting to maybe branch out, you know, to other provinces or how, how does it practically work out? Yeah, so that, that was one of the, one of the uh, things that we didn't know initially was that Rwanda was the land of a thousand hills. So obviously you, you might think you can come in with any type of product and it's going to work. So the initial, when we're still doing our, you know, just uh, introducing a product to the market, I remember this was back in 2018 there about, where we introduced our first set of bikes and really it was just bad. I mean, we're so grateful that things didn't work out. We didn't ship like a hundred or, you know, a thousand pieces, you know, you know, those bikes in because they couldn't get the job done. You know, and that's one of those things that as entrepreneurs, you might have a plan to do certain things, but certain things will hold you back. And that kind of held us back because now we have to go and redesign the product to fit the market. So right now, there are two different types of bikes that we're talking about. You have the regular small bike and then you have the electric uh, electric bike. Right now, what's in the market um, is currently the smart bike, which is kind of spread across, you know, downtown area in the city of Kigali. Um, which really doesn't require you climbing a hill, right? So what we're introducing next, our next batch of product that's coming in is more so of the electric, which also will be stationed throughout the city for now, where, you know, if you're going up the hill, it's pretty much an easy breeze, right? And that, the bikes operate on a battery swap. So you as the rider really don't have anything to do with the charging of the bikes. We handle that from the back end. Your, you know, your job is really just to, unlock the bikes, you know, pay whatever fee, and then you 
you know, you're, you're good to go as far as the right is concerned. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. And it's, and cool to hear that, you know, that, um, you've tried to, to mitigate all those risks, obviously oh, yeah. you, you can't, you know, like nothing is sort of, you know, risk proof, but right. you know, you sounds like, like you've iterated along the way you've assessed, you know, what the scene is. Um, and then you're sort of adapting your model based on, you know, what the market could there could potentially deliver and, you know, what the needs of, I guess, the customers are at, right. Cause in the end, obviously when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're designing a model, it's obviously you're thinking about, you know, who are the end users at Absolutely. the end of the day, right. And so, you know, in the case, you know, in the case of, of Sub-Saharan Africa, we think, okay, well, and I like what you said, obviously, like we're not just in there to, to make money because like, we want to make money. We can go to all these different other markets and, you know, in the West and whatever, but obviously, you know, they're the thing of, you know, solving an actual solution and making an impact. And then obviously through that, obviously then, you know, there'll be some, you know, um, some dividend that, you know, yeah. through your labor, you know, you'll be able to reap from that and, 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 and definitely, definitely aware of that. So I guess in terms of like, um where you see where you see things going and obviously it sounds like so you've been in operation for about since 2017 ish around there um you know where do you see you go right going and and um i guess maybe just simply is this uh an area or a space that's worth investing into so if i'm a potential investor um you know, is this something going forward over these next, you know, short term to medium term? Is this something that, you know, is, is worth investing into? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, ultimately, you got, we think of Gura, right? And really all of our projects as the forefront of, you know, um, revolutionizing the transportation sector in Africa. You know, I remember when Uber first came around, I, I actually remember my first Uber ride, right? And nobody knew Uber back then. I mean, um, they had so many hiccups along the way. Nobody, and gradually the bus started to, you know, kind of go around. They started to develop and grow from there. And now Uber is really in almost every, you know, prominent country, right? So our goal really is to be in the Uber of Africa, not just with the bike ship, but with all our different, you know, uh, business models. So we're only talking about Google right now, which is one of the five companies that we operate in Rwanda, right? So when we, we're, we're really just positioning, our, positioning ourselves to dominate that e-mobility sector. Right now, if you go to Rwanda, you mentioned any of our products, people know what you're talking about, right? And so you got to think about it. We really haven't, we don't have any major investors. There's no venture capitalists. There's no uh, any round funding. This is all like sweat equity, you know, personal funds, friends and family that we've been able to build to where we are. So the question now is what happens when we start getting different funding from major investors? You know, we've already gotten, you know, people from Kenya, from, uh, uh, you know, Congo, right? People from Ghana, Nigeria, reaching out to us to set up the same infrastructure in those different countries. You know what I'm saying? So it's all a strategic move. And that's really one of the reasons why we chose Rwanda because like, listen, man, it, Rwanda is one of those places where you can do business with peace of mind, you know, and I'm, I'm telling you because I've done business in Nigeria, I know what I'm talking about. And if you're going to do business in Africa, you want to set up your base in a country that has stability, stable government, and they want you to succeed, right? The biggest, one of the biggest hiccups of doing business in Africa is lack of infrastructure and corruption. Those two things, you, I don't know, you know, if things are, people are corrupted in Rwanda, but at least from what I've seen, we've experienced zero corruption, right, from starting a business. Trust me, that's the reason why a lot of foreigners are trooping into Rwanda. You get what I'm saying? So ultimately, you know, now that the foundation has been laid in Rwanda, now we can comfortably say, you know what, now we can, you know, maybe start a franchise in other parts of of Africa. Wow, no, that's 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 great to hear. And I remember you mentioned in an earlier session about like um, like the vision, I guess in terms of um, in terms of like how many bikes or that you want to see, um, I guess transition to um, 
to like the green economy there but you no know, like there was like some like number i remember that you i think i think it was thirty five thousand. i think that was 000. the number yeah 30, okay. so that's you, we're talking about a motos now right so yeah. that's like other business that we haven't talked about yet which is soft you know um and that that right there the government is probably i won't say they're more interested in that than the bikes but they have they want to see a major transformation in that sector and the, the you know unfortunately i can't really share all here but the kind of yeah. things that we have online for that sector it's it's crazy you okay. know and that's why i'm confident that look you know e-mobility in rwanda rwanda is going to set the pace every other african country you know I me mean? as far as e-mobility is concerned and we're just excited to be at the forefront of that you know when when you're talking about e-mobility one of the first whether you're doing a presentation or you're calling stakeholders to talk about the e-mobility segment safi guru right is at the forefront they want to hear what we have to say about e-mobility because we've built that niche right and built a brand around that which is something that we're very excited about no, that, that, that's great. And, and, and that's definitely something that you that you see a lot, you know, coming out of the, the region there in Rwanda in terms of like, you know, wanting to make it a conducive environment to to test out your proof of concept. Right. Absolutely. So and, 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 re, and realizing that, you know, you know, we have to be very honest, like we are a very small market. Right. So right. in the case we're like 13, 14 million ish around there, um, you know, but our neighbors you know, you look at Uganda, you look at Kenya, you look at Congo, yeah. Burundi, right? You know, like our neighbors in the region. And, and, you know, this is what I always keep saying in terms of like, you know, obviously like some things it, it, it's going to take, you know, some time to really have that integrated channel and off the infrastructure. But like when you're looking at that marketplace is realize, okay, you know, where can you safely do business? Like, where is your base? Right. And, and you know, talking to, you know, investors or entrepreneurs, or even here in Canada, US, it's like, hey, like, you know, where can I go to, you know, to first start off, right? What's a good soft base, right? That I could start off with, test this out, and then scale this up to the region and the content, yeah. right? And, 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 and I think that's, I think that's the, a good approach to have and, and, and say, okay, you know, like, let's let, let's really build up the center of excellence. And, and it's cool to hear that, you know, you're, you're, you're saying, hey, like, you have Gora, but you also have this other portfolios of ventures that we could also package and deploy you know, based on, you know, whatever the market needs in your region. And so that's, that's, that's definitely great to hear. Um, so maybe transitioning now, um, I want to open up this question and definitely, uh, you know, definitely want to open up for, for, for anyone else that maybe might have some thoughts or maybe some, some questions that they may want to ask to Depot. But um, you touched on it earlier in terms of, you know, coming in as a new player in the market, um, as, you know, a new startup, an entrepreneur in a business operating in a new market. So I'm wondering, you know, as a as a startup operating in a new environment, um, how do you build traction? And then like, how do you how do you gain those buy in from partners and customers? Like, is there like a strategy or a template that you follow? Because you know, sometimes there's so much information out there that you know it talks about. You know, how do you build customers? How do you win over partners? Is it through sending out? You know. 100 plus emails a day trying to get investors or is it you know a different more systematic approach but i guess you know in your experience how how do you how did you approach that sure so it's two things right manzi so number one is i remember i think it was steve jobs that said that most people don't know what they want right when you create it then you kind of basically make them want it right you create things and then people all of a sudden want it you and i, I don't know if you use apple phone or not but you didn't know you needed an Apple phone until an iPhone came up, right? Um, so same thing. All of our products, nobody thought about the fact that they need something like this. But when the products came out, like, oh, I like that, right? For example, like, number one, like, there are three key players in the e-mobility sector as far as the um, electric motorcycles are concerned. Um, but out of all three, when you talk about branding, we are untouchable, right? Even with our products. So, Everything that we do, that's the second thing that I'm talking about, right? The first thing is that you create something that the market will ultimately want, even though they don't know that they want it yet. The second thing is the branding, right? The branding is what separates those who are actually successful versus those who are still lagging behind, even though they're still operating in the same space. Um, we focus 
compared to the other two companies, right? In the e-mobility space, we are very, very young. You know what I'm saying? Like extremely young. Our team, you know, um, all of our staff are pretty much between the ages of 20 and 30. All of us, with the exception of one of our uh, partners, who's I think 50 something, my brother, the other partner here in the States, we're all under 40. Do you know what I'm saying? So one of the things that has led to our success thus far, I would definitely say is part of our branding package. Including within that branding is our ability to communicate, right? Um, business requires, you know, efficient efficiency in communication. So if you're unable to communicate your ideas effectively to investors or to your, to your customers, they're not going to buy your product, even though your product is the best product in the market. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to say because we have American accent, they give us an advantage. That's not it. But being able to put together a presentation and present it in a way to the market that, hey, you guys need this product. And you, guess what? They said, you know what? We do need this product. So not just the government, but the everyday people need our product. They want our product. For example, like at our EV charging station, every time our bike pull up to get charged, Literally, you can see as much as 100 motos gathering around just to see like, whoa, like I've never seen this type of bike before. I've never seen, you know, a bike pull up into a gas station, which is the EV charging station and get charged up. You see what I'm saying? So it's all about branding. It's all about market perception, things that you learn in business school, but we just basically are implementing it in real life. Yeah, no, that's, that's some great solid advice. Um, you know, definitely giving, you know, giving the market or, or or sort of selling it to to what they need, right? And 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 really creating that vision and really just selling that. So that's why I think even, you know, like at the core of it, um, is is you know being able to sell, I think is like a very strong trait that, um, you know, sometimes we you know, may overlook and then realize, you know, while we're, while you're building and while you're at the, the stage of, you know, going from your ideation to building MVP and then you're ready to like start getting out there, but like being able to sell and to market and to brand, it's, 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 it's pivotal. Um, so there was a, actually, maybe I'll, I'll allow um, Charles actually to talk. Um, so Charles, maybe if you want to ask your question. I think I've, I've unmuted you. If not, I could, uh, I could read it oh, here. I, I know Charles. You know Charles? Yeah. I do. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, um, so he asked, um, okay, I'm actually, so I'm reading this question now. Yeah. And, uh, okay. So for Epo, I'm a founder who has also started a business in Rwanda. While I agree that we don't, do any thinking about profit. We know that a business cannot survive well without money. Let me add that. Um, I'm also aware that funding is challenging. You can use your own money initially. However, that's not sustainable. What do you, what did you do right to succeed and solve this challenge? So uh, it's a very, very, it's a great question, honestly. And it's a, it's one of those situations that we also had challenges with so i remember when we first started because one you know once again you have this brilliant idea and you're thinking that people are automatically going to buy into it because you think it's great and i three four years ago i remember doing multiple presentations to people like hey listen we got this idea we're going into this country like this is what we're doing obviously they've seen it they've seen it in, in the united states they know how it works we did the numbers and everything it sounded great Nobody was willing to drop money. You know what I'm saying? Like, it would just, yeah, it sounds great. I'll get back to you. But they never got back to us. So initially, literally, my, my, one of my partners emptied out, um, uh, took out um, equity on his real estate property. Um, I cleared all my investments, right? My brother, whatever he had to do to raise money, so did my other partner. So we really, like, it was one of those things that we either win or we lose and, and losing was not an option. So you do get to a point where you exhaust your own capital. Now, the question is, how do you raise more bread? Which is what bread, sorry, I, I apologize for my, uh, my uh, United States uh, vernacular, but 
bread, we call it's it money, good. right? So it's all good. It's all good. Same <laughs> thing over here, man. Um, so it's yeah, uh, uh, how do you raise more bread? Let's just keep it real, right? So <laughs> yeah. you raise more bread. And one of the things that I think has helped me, not just with any of our projects, really with any business that I do, is my ability to use social media, to use technology to market what I'm pr uh, promoting. And it boils down to what I said earlier, which is branding, okay? The, re the number one reason why people see, I mean, people partner with us is because they see what they're putting their money into. People won't invest in your project just because you think it's a great idea. Nobody cares about great ideas. There are millions of great ideas. People want to invest their money into something that's actually working and it's appealing. So what I do is that I've, you know, I have a, I've, one of my skills is my ability to use digital marketing, all right? And anything that I do, like this right here, you guys can see my iPhone, this is my money maker, right? As long as I have my phone and I can create content, right, I will make money. Our businesses will make money. And that's why they say content is king because we now live in the digital world where you wake up every day, right? And Manzi, let's be honest. What's the first thing you do in the morning? Uh, well, well, maybe, <laughs> may, well, maybe not you, right? But <laughs> most people, the first thing they do is they grab their phone, True. right? True. What's the first thing they do when they grab their phone? You're not checking your, you know, checking to see if your mom called you. You're going to Instagram. You're going to TikTok. You're going on LinkedIn, Facebook to see what's happening around the world. So everybody is glued to their phones. So the more people see your content, the more they're in their conscious mind, they want to know what you're up to. So what I focus on for all of our projects is we got to make sure we're putting out content, right? So if you look at, for example, Charles, Charles found me because he saw one of my content on LinkedIn, right? Um, uh, who else? Who else? The other gentleman, the, the other presentation that we did, he found me because he saw my content. He wasn't Googling Gura Osafi. He saw my content. So the more we get, the more you get your product and your service in the face of people, the more likely people are to be more interested in what you're doing. And obviously, even with that, you got to be able to have a pitch as to why people should invest in your project. I give you an example. Some of our friends and family that, you know, partner with us, it's either they just love the idea of investing in Africa. Some of them have never been to Africa, but like, hey, like, wow, this is a great project and I would love to see this project succeed. Hey, take this money and you can give it to me back whenever you want some interest. Some people just want to get their foot in the door as to investing in Africa, but they're looking for reputable companies. You know, and I said before that one of the most challenging things to do in Africa is to find trustworthy people and companies to do business with. So when people see you online, when they see your content, there's that trust factor that goes into that, right? So obviously there's a lot more that goes into branding, digital marketing that I can't really fully dive into, but those two things have really been what has helped us far to get where we are. Wow, wow, no, it definitely dropped a lot of gems there. And um, I agree with you. It, 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 it's, you know, more and more, it's, it's the content is king, right? So if, 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 if people are, you know, if they're seeing you, if they are seeing what you are able to bring and the value you're able to provide, um, you know, even before, like you said, even before even knowing about your idea or your venture that you're, that you're building, you're like, okay, well, like, who are you? Like, who is the person that's even behind this, right? And, and, sure. and if you can catch them first with that first impression of, you know, yeah. hey, this is who I am. And actually, by the way, this is what I'm building. And this is how maybe you could come along this journey and, you know, definitely, mm -hmm. you know, check out that. And then, and, and that's good, right? So basically, you can, you, you can basically build your customer base without, you know, even, you know, actually having or deploying the, the product right there. But you are, while you're building it, you're, 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 I guess don't want to use the word followers, 
but you know, the, you know so much of the society is, yeah. is is really you know gravitating towards that 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 followership but it's okay but then it's like you know going a bit more deeper than that you know like what are you what are you providing and you know why are people wanting to look you up right exactly that's that's but that's i think to, to product toss he says investing i think investing in africa as a black founder let's be honest mm -hmm. it's hard um so <laughs> I, I don't this and this is my personal opinion right i don't make excuse for this for me right i don't make excuse for my skin color i don't make excuse for my accent um it's all mindset um you know, if you're a winner, you're a winner. If you're a loser, you're a loser. It has nothing to do with your, your background or nothing, right? Your mentality determines, um, you know, what you put out there into the world. Uh, for me, I don't care what you put me in this world. And, you know, this might be going off topic a little bit, but I believe that any business that I touch, I win, right? I don't care whether I'm dealing with white people, black people, Asian people, it doesn't matter. It's all my mindset that if I'm in it, I'm going to win, you know, and that's why, like, for example, like Charles' business and Charles, we talked about this. Like, you have a business that look. If I own your business, like, trust me when I tell you, man, like, it's going to be hot cake because you are in a in a line of tourism, and Rwanda is a place where people. I still talked to somebody yesterday, an African American woman who wants to go to Rwanda, right? But the thing is, most people who go to Rwanda, they don't know like, where to go, what to do. But if they see something, and it's not just about seeing, like something that's appealing, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I've never, I've been to Rwanda a plethora of times. I've never seen gorillas, you know? I've never been to any exotic place because I'm strictly business. I'm just going there for business. I'm in, I'm out. But when you put out content of what's appealing to people's eyes, you won't have to go and tell people to come up. I what you want. they will come for it. You know, so it all goes down to, look, how do you identify what people want and how do you create the type of content that will draw them to what you're offering? You know, so it's not, a, as I make it sound very simple, it's not that simple. It requires hard work. It requires you investing in, you know, equipment and, you know, technologies and so many things to create this appealing content but ultimately those investments do pay off very true yeah that's 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 key and and i think um you know for for many communities um you know on the continent or even diaspora it's like you know just even putting stuff out there like that's even um for some folks terrifying right or, but then yeah. you know like it, it's it's you know or you know we've been conditioned to think that you know we're bragging about ourselves or you know what we're doing and everything like that and and, and so you know like within some cultures like that's like you know a big thing and so i think you know even just how you articulate it, it it's like it's 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 having it's having that confidence um at the same time like there is like i think i finally believe like there, there could still be like that humbleness that's that's oh, wow. associated you know with it right um you know and, and and so this is this is how you are projecting yourself and your business and everything like that so um so i agree i i, I, I definitely agree um i think charles knows the charles yeah sure yeah let's um let me Charles, yeah, maybe you could. Uh, Hi, guys. Sorry, you cannot see me. My camera is off, but can you guys nope. hear, hear me, though? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Hi, Deepo. How are you? Hey, Charles. <laughs> what's going on? Uh, anyways, so essentially, what I meant is it's just like you. I don't let the, my, like, the color of my skin define me. But what I meant, we need to have the hard talk because, regardless, you know, um, I can give you an example. There is a guy who landed in Kenya and was able to raise a million dollars just like that within the span of one week. He's not even from Kenya. So what I'm trying to, to say is, is that regardless, and, and even in Rwanda, and I have seen this, there's always some kind of favoritism that is given um, um, to non-Blacks because there is still a mentality that the Western people do things better than us. I mean, I can tell you that I went to Rwandan Development Board since the launching Zanihaza more than once to just request a simple meeting 
not any favors, just a meeting to speak to the, to the director of the culture department that I was referred to, to someone who said, you know what, the idea you have is really great and they have some challenges. So those are, you know, you know sort, of the, sort of the challenges and, and they are there. And then I, I think we need to have a frank talk about it so that we can grow and then we can reach what we are trying to achieve as a founders um, who have looked back home. That's what I was trying to say there, Deepo. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you shared that. And I think one of the things we got to also realize when you, when we hear um, companies, oh, this company raised 9 million, 10 million. It, it's not on the outside. It sounds very great. Like, wow, when will my turn come? But the question we got to ask ourselves is, what are these founders giving up to get this 10 million? Um, that's why, for example, we've had opportunities to kind of raise that, that kind of money, but we're not willing to give up not even 20% about any of our companies, right? That's the pride that we have in building our projects. So anytime, Charles, you hear somebody raise 100 million, I guarantee you that the more money they raise, the less control they have over their business. So if you're just looking to raise money, trust me, eventually you'll hit a jackpot and at the same time, you become an employee in your own business, even though you still have the founder title. Give you a prime example. Steve Job, the founder of Apple, got kicked out of his own company. He founded a company, right? But the moment you start attracting investors, you go public, you don't own the company unless you control 51% and you have majority of the state, right? So I don't get distracted and I, I strongly suggest that any founder on here that don't, you know, it's always good. It might take time to build your business from the ground up. You look, you know, if I tell you the kind of sacrifices that we've been through that we're still putting in to build our projects, you won't want to be an entrepreneur if you're not an entrepreneur already, right? Because what I know is that every successful business, every successful entrepreneur, they have a story. And it's usually the story that makes the glory a lot sweeter, not the money you make in a process. When you're able to tell someone that there was a point in time when you only ate once a day because you have to make sure that your staff could, you know, you can pay your salary. There was a point in time where you have to start, you know, maybe I'm not saying that's our story, but I'm just sharing with you what happens during the journey of entrepreneurship. So yeah, Charles, your situation might be, yeah, you are at a place where, you know, fund is not coming in. You're not attracting investors. Business is not moving as fast as it should. Trust me, you got to be willing to put in that sweat equity to go through the process. You're still in a process phase right now, you know, but when you go through the process phase, you build the foundation, you'll be amazed as to how you start to attract people without you actually putting in any effort. Wow, no, that's, that's, that's powerful. Um, definitely profound. And, and just, you know, the story behind it, like, like I, I, I really believe that, you know, like those are aspects to not, I cannot overlook. Right. And, and, and so the story and, and, you know, the sweat equity and, and, you know, the things that are happening behind the scenes, which no one else, you know, may see, you know, but um, you know that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to produce, you know, yeah. like what you said, glory, right? And so how do we, how do we get to that? And um, yeah, and I also, I also, um, I also agree that, you know, sometimes like I don't get too phased when hearing, you know, such and such has raised this much, you know, 100 million or whatever. It's like, yeah, like they're probably they don't have a lot of equity still left in that, or it, it's like, you know, in the next five years, that company is going to look totally different possibly, oh, absolutely. right. Absolutely. Than what it is right now. Right. And, and so we're looking at, you know, within different sectors, like even if you break down, even within the FinTech sector and it's great. And I'm loving, you know, the amount of investments that are, that are pouring in, um, you know, towards that, you know, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see the next five years, you know, um, how these businesses and startups are going to look like, and and so I think it's 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 a it's a strong point I think to to also you know, not just chasing the funders and investors you know but really you know 
go from the basics, build that foundation, you know, get those customers, right? In the earlier session that we had um, uh, two weeks ago, we had uh, Dan uh, Dusady. And so she was also talking a little bit about, you know, just, you know, focus in on, you know, the customers and the journey. And so, you know, you don't need that capital to, to, to start, but of course there's different ways of being creative. Like you said, may, you may have to, you know, invest in a couple of different aspects that, you know, that could create that good customer experience so that you could sort of, you know, creating that brand. But I think there's like a, some key foundational pieces that, you know, we shouldn't rush the process and just think that, okay, well, now I'm ready to now go for the big boys or the big girls and just go for those investors. So, um, strong point. Um, so I guess coming to, to the close of our, of our session here today, this has been a great conversation. Really, really love like this discussion here and, and, and for everyone that has contributed, um, towards this discussion, um, and you know, really you just sharing your heart and, and sharing just your journey, um, and I, I definitely, you know, think that it, it speaks volumes to, you know, the character of you and how you've been able to, you know, develop, you know, within these certain uh, various businesses and, 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 you know, also keeping in mind that, you know, like you don't want to, you don't want to sell yourself short or you, you don't want to, in, in a sense, you know, you know, you know, bend over to another way just to appease, you know, where this new, you know, phenomenon is going towards, right? You, you kind of want to stay grounded and firm in, in terms of, you know, what you want to deliver at the same time you want to execute results too. Um, so maybe just last, in terms of advice, and we, you know, and I know we've talked a little bit about, about advice. And so I'm wondering in terms of, you know, what you would provide to, what, what type of advice would you provide to aspiring entrepreneurs that are in the diaspora that are interested in launching a business in Africa? And, um, and um, yeah, so, and also, what can, how can people find out more information about you, your services, and go ride and following uh, your journey? Uh, I think from an advice standpoint, obviously, if you're not from Africa, you know, anywhere in Africa, um, I will caution investing before you actually visiting the country you want to invest in, uh, because there's so many moving pieces, different dynamics in different countries that you got to understand the you know, the people, the culture, um, the environment, it's enough to learn and know whether or not it's conducive for uh, the business you're trying to establish there. Alternatively, what I've also told people, share with people is that if you don't have the opportunity to actually go to invest or start something, perhaps look for, you know, maybe companies like Tars Businesses or even some, some of ours and you can form some type of strategic partnership with that still gives you ability to still, you know, invest and make money in Africa. Uh, but ultimately, you know, definitely visiting Africa, uh, number one, do, and number two, doing your feasibility study as to whether or not what you're providing is needed in that country. So, for example, if we took Gururide right now and we took it to Nigeria, or if we started with Gururide in Nigeria, the business would have already failed before it even got started because the atmosphere, the environment is not yet conducive for this type of structure to succeed, um, at least to the level that we are now. Okay. So those are some of the things that you got to understand the dynamics of the different countries in Africa. Um, as far as um, what was the second question? Uh, yeah. So just where can, um, People okay. find out more information about you know you your services, grow ride journey. So um, I guess to, as far as like connecting with me, I'm pretty much on all social media platforms: LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Not so much TikTok, a little bit, but mainly Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, but mostly, if you want to connect with me, definitely Instagram and Facebook. Those are where I'm predominantly um, you know spending a lot of time on. And if you want to find out more about our companies, obviously you can go on Instagram. We have our different pages. You can go on our website, um, Safi Ride, uh, Safi Run, Guru Ride. I mean, it just, it's all, it's all there, right? You can easily type it in Google as well, you know, and then from a partnership or investment standpoint. So we do have several, you know, different strategic ways where people can partner with us, where you can actually purchase uh, at least from Safi standpoint, we can actually purchase a bike, um, you know, and then you kind of get some kind of return based on 
the, you know, the income being generated from that. So, I mean, just different ways where you can, where we work with people, but ultimately to connect with us, you know, social media for sure. If you are in Rwanda or planning to go to Rwanda, you know, you can equally visit our office, um, which is right across the street from the convention center, you know, so, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. No, for sure. And, um, you know, we, we have, we have lots of folks, well, I guess before this breakout of this Omicron that were, that were visiting, that were going back home for the holidays, but I, I think probably now things, I, I think this month are going to be a, a bit quiet, but um, I think, you know, for sure, yeah, definitely um, hit them up. Um, if you're there in the city, you'll I'm probably sure you'll be able to, to see their bikes and uh, Absolutely. Just, to, just to test it out, um, you know, share it with your friends and family that are back home. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, going back home. And the first thing I'm going to be doing, you know, and, and I'll and I'll let you know my experience. You know, awesome. I'm going I'm, I'm to go on. Actually, I want to test out my first bike share experience. It's, it, I guess it's fittingly it'll, it'll be in Rwanda because I haven't tried it out here in Canada. So I want to try it out there in Rwanda and see how it's like document my experience. And then, you know, definitely, nice. definitely blast this out. And so. Um, yeah, definitely. I also want to be continuing supporting, you know, the initiative that you're doing and, and just to applaud, you know, you and your brother um, for for taking the courage to to really invest, you know, in Rwanda and, and, and really want to see, you know, this types of solutions and, and really investing within, the, you know, the green infrastructure and, and, and everything like that. And so so definitely, you know, definitely applaud that. And yeah, I'd like to. You know, thank you again for taking time out of your schedule. You know, this was great. Um, for anyone that's joining us here today, thank you for joining. We will be sharing the recording. We'll put it up on our YouTube page, uh, as well as following us on all our social media pages. We'll, we'll, we'll include some clips, uh, and as well as a you know, follow-up email. We'll send a feedback survey, and we'll also include a link to provide, and as well as the other um, portfolio companies in which you can find out more information. If you're also thinking about investing, then th this would definitely also be a great opportunity to also explore further. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time. Um, wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. Thanks um, a lot all the awesome. best. Yeah. Appreciate you. We'll talk soon. All right. All right.